Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by ShareFile from Citrix. Secure file transfer built for business. Visit sharefile.com, click the microphone, and enter TWIST for a free 30-day trial. And by SourceBits. Visit sourcebits.com to begin your mobile app development journey. Today on the program, Matthias Mikcha, who is the CEO and founder of Stardoll, which has 20 million uh, young women using the product on the web and now moving to mobile. And so today on This Week in Startups, we're going to learn about shifting your web business into a mobile business. And Matthias is right in the middle of this, and he's a a highly successful entrepreneur who has garnered tens of millions of users, and now he's got to get them from the web onto mobile. It's a great story. Stardoll is with us today. Stick with us. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Funny is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Yeah. Money is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals until we get the money, spend the money, and defeat you. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups, the show where we talk about building startup companies and products that hopefully change the world. Or they fail, and they go down in a flaming wreck, and we learn something. And trust me, for me, my career, I think I'm batting like 500, which it would make me like the best uh, baseball player ever. But in entrepreneurship, let's face it, if half of the stuff you do fails, that can really screw with your mind. But the fact is, failure is the precursor to success. Every time I've gotten my, my ass kicked as an entrepreneur, or seen my colleagues, entrepreneurs, get their asses kicked, that's the sign that they usually learn something critical, brushed the dirt off their shoulders, got up, and then crushed it. And that's what we talk about on this show. We talk about, honestly, how goddamn frack and hard it is to be an entrepreneur, how much pain and suffering there is, how psychologically devastating it can be at times, but also, how absolutely glorious it is to make something in this universe. You get one spin around the globe, and to sit there and not try to make something or be part of a team that makes something that's epic, that serves some bigger mission, um, and that people just love and enjoy, boy, that would be a waste, right? So I encourage everybody to be an entrepreneur, but gosh, not everybody is uh, ready to be an entrepreneur. It's going to be a brutal journey if you do choose to take it. But this is your resource. This week in startups now, we're, we're, we're closing in on 400 episodes. I've been doing it for four years. Two or three times a week, I meet with an entrepreneur uh, or a venture capitalist or an angel investor or media pundit like Doug Rushkoff was recently on the program. And we talk and we talk and we talk about this huge puzzle, which is creation, which is a startup, which is entrepreneurship, which is being a founder. And it is a puzzle. And it's constantly changing. It's like, here's the Rubik's Cube. By the way, we just went from you know a 3x3 three three cube to a 4x4 four four, to a 5x5 five five, to a 7x7. Seven seven, and now it's not colors, it's symbols. It constantly changes. The advice that we learned in the first year of this episode is probably you know, changed in a lot of time and cases. And so you need to tune into this program every week. This is your workout. This is your going to the gym. I am your personal trainer. I am going to kick your ass so that you learn from all the mistakes that I've made and other entrepreneurs have made. Sound like a good deal? Great. It's only $1,000 a year to subscribe to the program. No, it's free. And it's free thanks to my friends at ShareFile. That was a pretty good ad segue, you think? Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) Listen, uh, ShareFile is a great product, and... um, Most businesses uh, email their attachments, right? Docs, spreadsheets, PowerPoints. Um, But we need to make sure that stuff gets in the right hands and that it stays confidential. And that's why ShareFile is important to every business. With ShareFile, you can send attachments as secure links. And when you send these, you can send any size with the highest degree of security. Track the progress of your files. See who's accessing them from what computers and mobile devices is auditing stuff. So this is sort of like industrial sharing file sharing. Um, and we use it here at This Weekend and Launch. We can request files from our clients here. If you look on my screen, we'll just say, hey, can you send me this file that we need for the show? Uh, we can see the audit trail and get alerts. So tell me if people are uploading or deleting or editing or moving files or creating URLs or restoring files or creating folders. We have all this sort of deep 
um, audit trail of what's going on with our files and with our folders, which is critical. Uh, we want to know if a sponsor uploads a file or if a client downloads a file. We need to know that, and we know it in real time. It makes us look like we're on it. And being on it is sort of one of those things in entrepreneurship that you want to be. Uh, and as you can see, we show these huge, huge things. Here's the source bit spot. They uploaded 800 megabytes, no problem. And we can see, oh, here are all the people who have been uploading it and downloading it and what rights they have to it. Just all that audit stuff makes things awesome for us. And I highly recommend ShareFile. You need to sign up for your 30-day free trial right now. No credit card required. Visit ShareFile.com, click on the radio microphone button, and use the promo code TWIST. I said This Week in Startups, T-W-I-S-T. So go ahead and go to ShareFile, click on the radio or microphone button and start your free trial. Uh, thank you so much, ShareFile. Um, and oh, by the way, we have the ShareFile uh, Twist Club. You can download the uh, top 10 questions ever answered in this program uh, episode, a special episode. Step one, sign up for ShareFile using the promo code TWIST. Step two, send us a request a file link to sharefile at launch.co. So just say share request a file, sharefile at launch.co, and we send you that file. Boom, and now you got the 10 episodes, the 10 best questions across the 400 episodes or so we've done, available only by requesting through sharefile. Matthias, we've known each other for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. Yep. Uh, we're both uh, backed by the same venture capital firm, Sequoia. Exactly. And uh, your business uh, has been a juggernaut amongst one of the hardest demographics to capture online, which is young uh, females. Exactly. How did the company start, and, and how did you get to tens of millions of young girls using Stardom? Well, the company history is not your typical Silicon Valley or typical entrepreneurial story. The company actually started out as the brainchild of a 60-year-old Finnish uh, lady, uh, ex-cleaning lady and factory worker, a fantastic woman called Lisa, who grew up and lived her whole life in Finland. And in 2002, uh, one day at home with her two sons watching them play violent video games, huh. she thought, isn't this crazy? Why doesn't anyone do something beautiful, creative, and fun for girls? And she started looking around on the web, and she saw nothing out there for girls. And when mm. she was a kid growing up in the 50s, she had paper dolls, you know, the mm. old style paper dolls that she did for her younger sisters. So she came up with the idea of virtual paper dolls. She got her first computer, taught herself to draw in, you know, Photoshop, Illustrator, came across a trial version of Flash one day, imported the stuff into Flash, and came up with the idea of when you move the thing, you know, the garment with a mouse, you could actually have a virtual dress-up doll. So wow. she drew 2D dolls, you know, body on one side, garments on the other side, and you dressed up what a celebrity. What an entrepreneurial story. It is a fantastic story, and she is a fantastic uh, lady. So she came up with the idea of virtual dress-up, and she had no business, you know, idea behind it. She did it for herself. She had mm. her personal homepage. She put these celebrities out there, you know, international celebrities that she saw in the glossy magazines of Finland, mm. you know, Finnish stars or Hollywood stars, and Madonna, I think, was her first wow. dress-up doll. And she just put these dolls out there, and, and the so soon all responded? traffic, yeah, responded. And um, by 2004, she had gotten her first real server, her first mm -hmm. homepage, called paperdollheaven.com and traffic was just going through the roof. And uh, that's when I got in. I, 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 I got in the company together with uh, Index Ventures, a uh, European uh, sure. venture capital firm, who looked at the company and the who original- Who are the principals over there at Index? You have uh, and, Danny Reimer? Yeah, the, not, the Reimer brothers. There's the Reimer. three of them. Yeah. Exactly. And Mike Volpe here in the US. And so how does that go down? The VCs are scouring for these little sleeper projects, and then they look for some professional manager like yourself, and then match you? Or did everybody know, or does it just like press? Like how does this little tiny, you know, homegrown project reach Index Ventures, the number one or number two VC firm in, in Europe? Well, in this case, I think it was actually one of the, uh, it, was, it was a relative of the, the Reimer wow. brothers who had a daughter who was 10, 12, 
who had found the site, showed it to her uncle, one of the rhymers. They said, you know, with the, with the reptile eyes of a VC, they said, <laughs> wow, you know, this, <laughs> might, this might be the next thing. Wow. And, uh, well, this was actually pre-me, but there were, you know, there were travels back and forth between London yeah. and Turku, not Helsinki. And uh, in a, it ended up anyway with, with the Finnish founders saying, uh, you can you can buy the site from us. Uh, wow. You know we're, we're, we don't want to we don't want investment, but we want yeah. to to sell the property. Right. And that's when yeah, she's um, sixty some odd years old, so she probably would be nice to retire. Uh, but she's still an employee, oh, and she she's still a shareholder of the company. Wow, that's yeah. fantastic! What a great yeah. story. But I got in together with Klaus Holmes, a European angel investor. And index and bought the f you know bought the site. I was crazy enough to take it over and think I could do something else around mm. it because at that time it was basically dressing up celebrities, mm. uh, which was fun. But you know I thought it'd probably be more fun if you could dress up your own doll, ah. your own avatar. You know this was even pre the movie Avatar when Avatar was still was a right. geeky. This is the early 2000s, world. I guess. This is 2005, 2005, summer of 2005. So pre Farmville. Pre Farmville. Pre, pre everything. Pre everything. Yeah. And essentially, Flash was the big enabling technology at that time, huh? It made a lot of things possible. YouTube was based off of Flash supporting video. Made a lot of things possible. There was a lot of virtual worlds that came up in that 2005, 2006, 2007. 2D, uh, yeah. you know, at that time we also had, uh, you know, we had Linden Lab and Second Life. And World of Warcraft. World, yeah, a lot of 3D virtual worlds were in. Uh, but I really thought that if you did something fun that a you know, 12-year-old girl could identify with, it'd be much more fun than having dressing up a celebrity. And how interesting, you know, we're here in the United States um, and this sort of mythology about innovation coming from Silicon Valley and sort of even America having a lock on it. And this incredibly innovative um, virtual world with virtual currency and virtual items debuts well before Zynga did Farmville. Yeah, we were definitely not the pioneers. We were very early, but right. we had our, you know, siblings, cousins at Habba Hotel in Finland, also in Finland. Oh, yeah, Habba We'd been Hotel, doing it yeah. for a couple of years. Habba, right? There was SciWorld in Korea Sci World was that had been big. doing it for a couple of years. So we looked at them and we thought, you know, if we could build a site, if we could build an experience that's fun enough, that's free for everyone, but that's fun enough so that a couple of percent pay every month, mm. that could be a business model. I mean, nowadays we know that is the business model, the freemium, the free-to-play. But back then, it was really a novelty. People go, what? You don't charge? Are you going to pay for what? For stuff that's not real? Yeah, and then you're going to pay for a virtual dress. <laughs> exactly. And so when you to tell that to Index, we think we can, the model here is not selling the software or a monthly subscription like World of Warcraft, which was crushing it on the... What do they say when you say, we think we'll sell virtual goods? Do they say, you're crazy, or do they say, try it? No, they said, try it. Yeah, definitely. It was, it was kind of a joint decision between all of us. Because I knew, you know, we already had at that time, so, so the site, uh, you know, we bought, the site I inherited was called paperdollheaven.com. We rebuilt it into stardoll.com and basically flicked the switch, you know, took a deep breath and turn from one product to another. But at that time, we already had like two, three million uniques a mm -hmm. month. So we were already, we already had reach. Yeah. And having been an entrepreneur before in the media field, I knew reach equaled advertising dollars. Mm. But I also knew advertising dollars on a global basis. And especially in a demo that's that young, it's hard to monetize. Why is it hard? It's hard because, you know, if you, advertising is, Advertising revenue is easier if you have your own sales force, if you're really big in one country. It's easier to have two million uniques in one country than have two million uniques you know, spread globally. Oh, yeah. well, you know that, I know that. Super inefficient. Super inefficient. The only way you can monetize that is basically by remnant, you know, Google ads, et cetera. Some but if you want to sell your own premium integrated stuff, that's not where you begin. Mm -hmm. So we said advertising, you know, that could be a business model for us later, and it's now a very important part of our business. But when we started off, we said, you know, if we can get a couple of percent of these users to pay us, that's going to be our business model. And when did you know that that model would scale? How, how soon did it take? And did you have a moment in there where you're like, oh, God, I'm an idiot trying to sell virtual dresses? <laughs> you know, because this is one of the things. When you're doing something innovative, at times you can feel like you're an idiot, can't you? 
Yeah, it was a ga- I mean, to some degree, it was a gamble. I mean, we thought we'd build something unique. We looked around the web. There wasn't anything like it at the time. Maybe Asia, right? A little bit. In- yeah. Cyworld would sell some things, right? Cyworld sold. Yeah, the Cyworld were really, really innovative. They didn't just sell digital stuff. They actually had a time limit on it. So you bought like a virtual. Uh, you brought virtual furniture for your virtual living room, and it was time-based. You paid like $5, and as soon as you paid, a clock started ticking. And then, you know, at the end of a month, whatever, that stuff would disappear. Insane. So they were even more innovative. We that, didn't, that's pretty cutthroat. We didn't dare to go that far. We said, if that's you like buy a, that's some... That's like a payday loan company, yeah, or like yeah, rent-to-own yeah. company. Exactly. <laughs> now, we said, if you pay some... The analogy has to be, if you paid for something, it's yours. Yeah. So, you know, that's still a very important rule of Stardoll because now we have a secondary market as well. Users ah. can sell stuff peer to peer. So if you bought something like two or three years ago that's now out of stock, it can be worth a lot of money. And that is kind of an interesting William Gibson virtual light yeah. Doru. I don't know if you've read those yeah. books. Yeah. I mean, it really is amazing how science fiction just 10 years ago is now science fact. Yep. Uh, people, he, he postulated people would be buying kimonos and stuff like that and Yoduro and these virtual avatars because they wanted to look good in their, you know, big meeting for their uh, special interest group, their SIG. They would have to go and have a great outfit that time. And, and that is what happened. Exactly. Yeah, in our case, it's our, yeah, no, the, the most virtual, the most valuable item on Stardle are uh, virtual dresses from our 2007 DKNY collection. We worked with DKNY for, for four years, and uh, they were all limited edition. Wow. And uh, so you have that. You can trade it for How a do gazillion star dollars, which is our now, virtual currency. Now, when, when you go to DKNY on that sales call, and you're a former media exec, so you know sales calls, and you say, we want to use your brand yeah. on virtual dresses for little girls, how do you get them to embrace that without laughing and who pays who and how do you navigate the who's paying who because it would seem like that's a marketing opportunity for them in one way it would seem like for you you get to leverage their brand so maybe you should be paying i mean you could argue that three different ways yeah you're how, you're extremely right i mean that was exactly the the that was exactly take the, me to that the, moment the argument, take me to that meeting yeah. the argument we had uh, way back when, when we started. So I think our first meetings with brands was in 2006, 2007. And I would say nine out of 10, when we knocked on the door and we finally got to a marketing or biz dev executive within the fashion companies that we wanted to feature on the site, we always got back. So how much are you paying us? Right. And I said, no, you're going to pay me because I have 10 million users on my platform and it's value to you to have your brand featured on my site. Their argument back was, no, it's value to you to have. So, you know, at some, t- at some point you gotta see, yes, there are, there is value going both ways, mm-hmm. but we're, you know, we're a company, I'm an entrepreneur, I have to pay my bills. Right. In the end, I said, you know, if you're not paying, you're not gonna be on the site. Huh. Like a Vogue or like an L, you know, sometimes w- during these years we've made, uh, exemptions to that rule. Yeah. I'm sure that a Gap or any other, you know, big brand advertiser mm-hmm. maybe pays a little bit more for their full page ad in Vogue than the new hot trendy mm-hmm. independent designer. Got it. Yeah, there's a little negotiation, a little give and take there because they want to build the, the ecosystem. The same with us, you know, the same with us. We haven't but basically, if you want to be featured with your brand on our site, we're going to charge for it. Yeah. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. How do you for us? Pro- so in the, you, case of, yeah. in the case of DKY, it was actually a fantastic woman, the VP of marketing at DKY International at that time, who totally got it, who yeah, totally you can embraced, give her a shout if you want to or not. <laughs> totally embraced the yeah. site and the idea. We had a fantastic relationship. And so it takes, though, at that time, one out of 10, one out of 20 are going to yeah. get it and say, let's do it. Yeah, exactly. It's part of an entrepreneur, isn't it, is just being willing to see the beauty in the one in 20 <laughs> as opposed to the brutalness of 19 and 20. Yeah. <laughs> How do you psychologically get through that? I mean, you come home, you talk to your spouse, or you talk to your team, and you're like, hey, we got 19 no's, but I think the 20th will be a yes. I mean, it takes a certain amount of delusionalness. Or? Exactly. Well, you can't do it forever. You know, you do it 90 out of 20 times, but you don't do 99 of 100 because then it's not worth it anymore. Ah. So I think, the, you know, for me, for us, I think DKNY was like the ninth of the 10th. Yeah. And then we did a couple of more. 
Uh, but we also realized that for our users, you know, real life brands were important, but they weren't that important. Hmm. We also started, know, you know, we had fantastic illustrators ourselves who came from the best fashion schools, who came from the best art schools. And when we noticed how hard it was to get external brands, I mean, it's funny because an, what is a brand? A brand is virtual anyway, right? A brand sure. is something that concept. lives in your head. Yeah. It's a construct. So the brand, so so you know, the idea of a brand is virtual from the beginning. So we also thought that you know we could fill, a, we can make our own brands. Ah. So really, from day one, we actually started making our own brands. Hmm. Our first brand was called Pretty in Pink, uh, and we just did you know that was our line for our young pink girls. Hmm. Uh, we had a lot of emo in goth girls, you know, was big yeah. in 2006, 2000. So we said, you know, we got to have something for them, something black, a lot of red. So, uh, you know, we came up with a, with a goth brand. And our users thought these brands were, you know, beautiful, well executed, and as worth as much as, you know, any other brand. So today, I think we probably have like 50 or 60 brands any given day on the site, out of which, you know, majority are Stardoll brands. And when you look at the top three or four brands, and having done this for whatever number of years it's been, you know, getting close to 10, <laughs> um, closer to 10 than to five, yeah. I guess, do you think you've created brands that would make their way into the Atom based world that you've tested them so well that this goth brand or this pretty pink brand has now a built-in audience of a million people it could become like angry birds is becoming a tv show or movie or i saw angry birds um candy at the movie theater just a couple yeah. of months ago do you think you're going to have that happen or well, has it happened it has already happened so we have a we have a clothing line at jc penny's you're for kidding. the last two years yeah so we have a startle clothing line and we actually have done individual lines around these brands as well. So we've had a Pretty in Pink line, we've had a Rio Chicas, which is our Latin line, hmm. at uh, JC Penney's as well. So we and, are. And how does that relationship with JC Penney work? You come in and say, "I've got, I've sold a hundred thousand virtual dresses. You should buy ten thousand real ones." Yes, we and show that we show them that we have a you know a fantastic following, a great brand. We have a licensing department. Yeah. Uh, we work with licensing agencies, and instead of them licensing any other, you know, movie brand or something else, they they can sign up for a licensing relationship with us, and we can actually provide them with a lot mm. of traffic and with a lot of, uh, you know, people who already know the brand and who love the brand. Hmm. All right. When we get back from the commercial break, I want you to tell me about the moment in which mobile comes in and becomes. The platform that, let's face it, Gen Y and even Gen Z, the, which is what people refer to as the generation coming after Gen Y, that's becoming the default. And you've got to now really make that jump, I assume. Yeah. And so when we get back from commercial, I want you to explain how you're making that jump. Because I think a lot of brands are dealing with that, uh, being mobile first or transitioning from the web to mobile. Uh, after these commercial break. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. What an amazing episode of This Week in Startups. This is... I'm so happy you tuned in. And uh, I want to tell you about my friends, SourceBits. Uh, they built for me the app for the launch festival where we did crowdfunding live for the first time, very innovative, and they did it under such time constraint, and they did it so deftly, and they were such great communicators. I would be getting wireframes in PDF format with all the pertinent questions, and they were on it, on it, on it. And I love... Um, they're design-led engineering. That's their mantra. They do a great job at it, meaning they understand that beautiful design is essential. And a lot of people ask, what happens after you contact SourceBits with your idea, right? And uh, the answer is the discovery process, an amazing discovery process. You meet with their team of designers and engineers and even the CEO for two full days, and they hash out all your ideas. This is ideation. This is discovery. This is understanding your customers, all that kind of good stuff. They get all the deliverables, like the functionality map, the initial wireframes, and the design concepts, and it only costs 5 k to use source builds to build your app. Uh, if you, it only costs 5K, if you, and if you use SourceBits to build your app, that cost goes towards the project. So you can just spend 5K and do this incredible two-day process uh, and learn a lot. Offer 
take a meeting with SourceBits and you get a 15 minute with me, 15 minute meeting with me. And you know, I love doing that. I've done this for about a dozen or so people, two dozen or so people over the last couple of years. A source, but maybe two dozen. As SourceBits been a partner on the program. SourceBits has done a great job for me. SourceBits done a great job for those folks. And even the folks who didn't wind up using and were like, I was really impressed with the process. Um, they do a great job. And if you build your app with SourceBits, I'm going to demo it here live on the show. So we really like to support our partners. SourceBits has been so supportive of us between the launch festival and also this show here uh, that we really appreciate it. New apps coming from SourceBits Twine. Twine. Oh, it's on tab two here. Let me see. And. Look at that. There is the design-led uh, engineering of source bits and Twine. Are you in? Here we go. Twine. Twine is revolutionizing the way you meet new people, and uh, they're establishing a cross-system of neutral neural links, whatever that means. That sounds pretty highfalutin. Uh, but think circle or highlight, but much, much better, and it's coming out next week. Go ahead and pre-register for Twine.me. I am intrigued, and I'm going to sign up right now for Twine.me. Twine.me. All done by our friends, Jason at inside.com. There's a little plug for me in there. See that? See what I did there? A little plug for me. Uh, thank you so much to SourceBits. Thanks to Twine, twine.me. Uh, and these folks over there do a great job. Mobile apps, cloud, and web development and design. Let's get back to this amazing program. All right. Hey, thanks to our uh, very special sponsor there for um, helping out the program. And, you know, we couldn't do this program without our white-labeled sponsors. And Matias and I are talking about sponsorships here and how to build a business. I had a very simple approach. I just picked the top 10, 15 brands I loved. Mm -hmm. And then I had our people call them and say, Jason loves your brand. Do you want him to read an ad for you? And they said yes. And then the e-cigarette company called and the protect your social security number business is called. And I was like, I don't really use those products. I'm not an e-cigarette kind of guy or, you know, monitor my credit score kind of guy. I kind of feel like those products are kind of scammy and I'm not going to read a commercial for them. Mm -hmm. And then we sell out. So thanks to our sponsors for doing that, our partners, if you will. All right. So things are going great. You're crushing it. Flash is the default on every single browser, 98% penetration, yeah. et cetera. And then Steve Jobs starts to say, hey, Flash sucks. Yeah. I have a beef with Steve Jobs. And he is like, I am going to destroy Flash. And he went on a relentless jihad against Adobe Flash under the auspices of the number one crashing piece of software in his tests were Flash. Whether that's true or not, I don't know that we all have clarity into that, but Flash has been buggy, so maybe it's a, a great cover for him. But he did try to destroy that company, didn't he? Well, you know more, though, more about that than, than I do. But uh, It was his, odd, though. Yeah, his, his war against Flash has certainly impacted us because, yeah, Flash doesn't work on any iOS device. And uh, as you know, you know, our site, you know, A, we have a website, B, it's built in Flash. So now wow. that the whole shift is happening from PC-based or desktop-based internet access to mobile, especially especially when it comes to entertainment, especially when it comes to a young audience. Sure. We're definitely, we're definitely hit by that. So we've been working on, a, uh, on an iOS version of Stardoll, our mm -hmm. flagship product, for over a year. It's wow. finally launching, knock yeah. on wood, uh, in a month. But that's hurt us, definitely. Yeah. And when you in sort of denial about like, hey, at some point the relented flash will work, or did you hold out hope for that? Because it has been amazing that they have been able to filibuster this. I thought for sure that Adobe would be at some point able to conquer Apple's objections, because it does work on Android, correct? Mm -hmm. And maybe not that well, but it does seem like they, they would have flipped their position, but they never did. It was, it was kind of like... Well, we never made any bets on it. You know, mm -hmm. we looked more at HTML5 or not the HTML5, you know, mm -hmm. iOS native or which route, which route to go. Uh, what conclusion did you come to? Yeah. Well, the conclusion is for, you know, for, for games, mm -hmm. you have to build native, you know, yeah. right now. It's, it's, the only, it's the only way, really, for us. Uh, but, f you know, for us, rebuilding everything from Flash was uh, definitely a pain. On the other side, we have 70, 80,000 graphical assets that we have in vector format. So we can use a lot of the underlying assets that we have used on stardoll.com into the mobile experience. But again, uh, you know, the whole front end, you have to rebuild it. So you're actually at a disadvantage to somebody starting from zero. I mean, yeah. that is the conundrum, isn't it? 
Yeah, we're definitely in a you know as a company we're definitely in in a transitional mode where where you know the web's not growing for us anymore. Startle.com is not growing for us. Mm. We know that our users are shifting on to mobile. We you know we are a global company, so it kind of evens out for us. But you can definitely see which regions of the world are shifting faster than others. Which ones are? Uh, Northern Northern Europe uh, mm -hmm. shifting the fastest. I mean, I just need to look in my own living room. I have a 12-year-old daughter. Uh, a year ago, she used the computer still for entertainment mm -hmm. and fun. But last November, she got her first iPhone, and since then. She only uses the computer for making homework, basically. Wow. The phone is her only first, second, third, fourth, fifth you know, means of communication, fun, information. It's interesting. We have a show called Wellcast on YouTube that's targeted at the, at the same demographic, 13 to 17-year-old girls, 10 to 17, I guess. <coughs> or though, actually, I can't say 10 to 13. I guess I can say 10 to 13 if they're watching with a parent. But anyway, YouTube is 13 and up, so <laughs> it's complicated, right? Yeah. Um, but boy, it's like 60% mobile consumption. And then the other shows we're doing on YouTube are a third mobile, and or just still a staggering number, but to have 60% be mobile is just extraordinary. It's crazy, especially if you've been in the in the web world a long time, as you have been, as I've yeah. been. I've been in since 95. And, you know, I've kind of built my career around being, you know, a tech guy or a semi-tech guy, at least, who sees the trends and yeah. builds business opportunities on them. And then suddenly you're kind of, you know, Standing on standing on the standing on the train station, watching the train yeah. roll, much faster than you thought. Yeah. And for us, that was really a year a year ago. A year ago is when we really saw that you know our web traffic was has always been growing. I mean, we've been we've never been Startle.com has never been a you know overnight success with a huge growth, and it's never had any downturn either. We've kind of been chugging along like yeah. a, you know like a diesel engine of right. the web. Uh, and then plateau. And then suddenly, you know, here comes mobile. Yep. And and really, you know, really surprised me. Even though we had planned for it, I always thought, as many other people did, that you know, mobile internet would come on top of desktop internet. Yeah. Desktop internet would just slow down a little bit. Yeah. And then mobile internet would come on top of that, right? right. That's what we all thought. Sure. But now we know that desktop internet actually, you know, it's yeah. ca it's cannibalizing. It is can definitely cannibalizing and. I saw a report recently, two plus hours a day in apps. I mean, and I still was thinking, my God, people are spending two hours a day on apps. What's going to happen to television? What's going to happen to video games? I mean, it's just taking over everything. And for young people, it might be even more than that. Yeah, but it's, as, as you also know, it's also simultaneous. I mean, sure, there is that. It's cross platform now. I mean, you're using, you know, you're using your iPad while you're watching TV, while you're, you know, doing WhatsApp or Viber or, or Insta, you know, on your cell phone. That's the world. And social, live has, in. social has taken a big step function up as well. That affects your product design as well, right? I mean, people are not as much into solo games as they are into just high collaboration. Yeah. So but Starter has always been social. Right. It's always been about showing off your, your fashion sense or your creativity on your avatar, mm -hmm. showing it off to others, getting feedback, having friendships, form clubs, having competition. So it's always been, you know, we, when we started, we said we were a community, you know, mm. a very old world. It yeah, was, community was social. Community is social, it per is se. Social. So Same we've always yeah. been social. Uh, but we've also been a virtual world where you can be whoever you want to be, mm. which is also a part of escapism is part of Stardall. So maybe, you know, behind that beautiful avatar is not always, you know, that, yeah. that, same, that same person. On Stardall, you can be whoever you want to be. Yeah, and, that's and you a can change your look. So, so we weren't. So we're not that social that you have to display your real name mm -hmm. and your real age and all and, and all of that. So so we've always been social, but not one to one social right. to your physical Facebook me. Right. And let's talk about the difference between boys and girls in their use of this technology. It, it seems to me the boys tend to like goal-driven stuff. Back to uh, your original founder of the site. Um, very goal driven. Mm. Let's complete a mission. Let's destroy everything in front of us. Um, and it seems like Farmville and some of those other ones are about accomplishment 
and recognition of accomplishment and sharing it and that kind of thing. Is that a is that something that we're putting on girls or that is actually true about the nature of girls and how they differ from boys? Yeah. I have yeah, a daughter a now good, and I wonder about that's it. That's a like, very good question. I mean, we've debated this internally in the company for yeah. seven years since we started. Okay. We so debated take me inside it. that debate. I mean, do it, girls want to play, you know, do girls want to compete? Yes or no? Uh, do girls like points? Yes or no? Do mm. girls like goal-driven games? Yes or no? Mm. I would say there's no black and white. I mean, there's definitely girls who like all of the stuff that we usually label boys with. But I would say that collaborative stuff, creative stuff, and social things where you you know where you share things where you don't really hmm. compete is definitely more a girl trait in games than with boys. I mean, Stardle nowadays is much more gamey than it was when we started. Sure. We now have levels, we have points, we have badges. We had a lot of gamification things did the, done did to Stardle, which our users like, but the overall, I would say, gameplay is still about collaboration and social and having friends and showing off to your friend, being one in the group. It's a very emotional issue for people, how we design games for girls versus boys. How do you as the CEO and founder, when you have a team obviously that you respect, you hire them, you employ them, um, when you have people who have differences of opinion and people do differ on this topic, how do you reconcile you know, somebody who feels strongly like, we need to make games that make girls more competitive. There must be somebody with that position. Or somebody with a position of, hey, we need to make it more social. And, you know, great products are not made from splitting the difference. They're made from, you know, some amount of leadership. So how do you, how do you navigate that? Do you test it? Or, or, or do you just let everybody have a voice and then say, you know what, you had your voice and this is what we're going with because I have to make a decision? All of the, all of the above. Take me through it a little bit. Expand. There must have been some passionate debates. There have been passionate debates. Do people walk out Definitely. the door because if they lose those debates? I mean, this seems like a, a, such a core mission thing that I, I'm just wondering, you know, with all your experience. Yeah, we have, we'd have our, we've had our, 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 our parts of that in the company. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes it's easy to say, let's test it. But then again, it's not that easy to test it. If you want to build a total new backend structure that supports missions, quests, Points, etc. Mm. That's nothing you just do on the, the back. Mm. You know, it's not a simple A/B testing, right. you know, with a landing page that you mm. do. That's something you have to, you know, you do your analysis. You look at the world. The world is going, and you say, should we do this or not? And you debate back and forth. And you know, in this case, we had you know a big majority of the people in the company that said we need to do this. We should do this. The gamification. The thing. gamification thing. Yeah. And uh, we, in the end, we said yes. We're going to do points and levels, but you know, it shouldn't be the f the only game loop mm. on the site. People who don't want to be part of that should still be able to keep their, their old gameplay. The yeah. gameplay where the community basically sets the rules. Right. Uh, so we did it, and, and we ca I think we did it really well. So the, the old users who already were having you know, their clubs and their competitions, who were basically building their own game within mm. the boundaries of the site, they could continue to do that. And then for everyone else, you know, there were the competitions and the levels and the badges that you could get. And what was the reaction to of the actual user base? You have legacy users and obviously new users. When you put people on that sort of treadmill, d obviously it increases usage. I've been on that treadmill with different games, yeah. Clash of Clash of Clans, I guess, is the number one game now I played. Yes. And before that, it was um, the NG Moco one. Mm -hmm. I can't remember. But anyway, these sort of like build your castle kind of games. Um, are those short-term crack? Like, do they give you this like sort of massive boost, but then burn people out because they feel like, oh, this game is becoming a drag? And you kind of does it? Is it a? Is, is it? Did you risk a community killing with l uh, accentuating leveling up too much? Game mechanics. Too I mean, much? we definitely thought a lot about our existing users and the existing community because yeah. if you have a very strong community as we have, mm. everything you do is going to be disturbing for them in the short term right. so we don't you don't want to offend them at the same right. time you want to show them that this is the way we're going and that's actually 
fun for you too. And if you don't think it's fun, you can still keep on your old game. So you communicated so that somehow? We communicated that. So we have a, you know, different levels of users. We have a lot of blogs mm -hmm. that are written by users off of Stardoll, about Stardoll. Mm -hmm. So they're very influential and they're probably watching this program as well. <laughs> so we let them know sometimes what we're planning to do and mm -hmm. if, you know, we get them to we, we release news to them first and let them ah. check it out and read about it and then introduce it to their readers and their peers. So a little letting them inside the tent to get that early feedback before you just push it to everybody, which is sort of Zuckerberg style. Like I'm just going to push it to everybody, and you guys deal with it. Yeah, we. I mean, we when we make the decision to push it, we, we will push it, but we let them know first, and we let them try it first. We have we have a couple of users that we call royalty, which is like the highest echelon of Stardust users. Mm -hmm. You've been a member a long time, and you. You've been, you know, been a paying member, and you've done all these other things. And what? we usually let, let them get the product first. What's the largest amount? Uh, what's the longest duration of user you've had? And what's the largest amount of time they've been active in the community? You know, just in terms of hours. Oh, we, st we still have we still have users who joined us in 2006. Wow. When we launched the game. Uh, even though so our seven media years, in, six or seven years in. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah. I mean, usually... So they started at 10, 12, 13 years old, and they're now approaching college age, you think? We have a lot of grown women as well wow. on the site. You know, our, 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 mean, our mean age is almost 16 on the site. Wow. Our median age mm. differs between continents and countries. I would say in, in, you know, in Europe and North America, the, the median age is you know, 10 to 15. In South America, it's you know 12 to 17. Mm. In the Middle East, where we are huge, you know, if Arabic were a country, now it's a language. Right. If Arabic were a country, it would be our number three country probably. And, and there, you, our users are you know 15 to 25 immediately. Are you, how do you deploy a empowering women's fashion product in the Middle East? in the Arabic speaking world where they are in some cases, you know, really upset about such things. Yeah, apparently apparently we found uh, you know, we never planned on it, hmm. but apparently our you know, the look and feel of Stardoll, the graphical part of it hmm. is is, you know, nice enough and safe enough for uh, you know, for a, for a Saudi Arabian mom to allow her daughter to be ah, on it. So not that offensive. No. No, there's no nudity. But if there's a bikini, swimsuit, I mean... Yes, you can wear that, yeah. Not in Saudi Arabia if you're a woman. Well, on Stardoll, you can. <laughs> and you know, we haven't been banned by any of those countries. Fascinating. And then we run the site in 28 different languages. So we run the site fully in Arabic, for example, and yeah. have moderation and customer service in Arabic. Interesting. I would guess that you're a big part of the cultural change there. I mean, I think a lot of these internet services, Facebook, even this women's empowerment movement, that must feel pretty good to to be part of that. I, I hope so. Yeah. Yeah. But what's more important for me is the heart, you know, what really makes me you know, feel proud and heartwarming is when you see the collaboration and the friendship on the oh. site. When you see, you know, a 16-year-old Al Albanian girl being best friends with a Texas girl sharing their stuff with, you know, someone from, from uh, Israel, Kenya. Israel, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Kenya, Israel. and China. Exactly. That's actually a great feeling. It's a great feeling. It does, it you know, when you think about the internet, that was supposed to be one of the high order parts of the goal, the mission of the commercial commercialization of the internet. I mean, at least for old school guys like us, it was to try to make the world smaller and increase communication between people yeah. who were at war with each other. Yeah. It actually is happening. That's a great feeling. That's a great feeling. So um, how would you describe the company today? Because you, you are doing many different products now. You've gone to... A yeah, exactly. A year, you know, two years ago, we were a one product company mm. on one platform. We did Stardoll.com on the web. Mm. Today, you know, we have Stardoll.com, which is still is our flagship product, mm. over, you know, 15, 60 million unique users a month from the whole world. But we also have Stardoll on Facebook, and now we have seven different mobile apps out there, mm. with a big one, Stardoll itself, coming on iPad and iPhone in about a month. So now we are, you know, we're a, we're a cross-platform entertainment company mm. that does both media and gaming, which is which is strange because yeah. if you're a web guy like myself, suddenly your CEO 
of something that's also a game development company. Mm. And I'm not a gamer, personally, myself. So right. there's a lot of new skill sets needed in the company. Yeah. Uh, and you need to jugger those two. Another thing is, you know, going from web, where we figured out the business model, which for us is two thirds is user generated uh, revenue, mm -hmm. one third is advertising, onto mobile, where the advertising part is st tiny. Yeah. Kind of, you know, the big brand advertisers that we have on the web, we work with the biggest, the biggest consumer brands, the biggest entertainment brands. We have our own sales team in the US and in the UK, et cetera. Yeah. Suddenly we're on mobile. And there, you know, what do you have there? You have interstitials now, and you have yeah. crazy spanners, and yeah. the, that's a big transition for us and everyone else. For the whole industry. Everyone else in this industry. Yeah, the lower third or the lower fifth banner on mobile just me it seems to be a terrible, terrible idea. It's got to be something better. Yeah. Do you like the idea of interstitials or play a video to play for free? Maybe pro version doesn't have a 15 second pre roll. Seems that's to be working what's working great now. For YouTube, yeah. That's what's working now. You yeah. know. You know, advertisers like video. Yeah. Users can stand it, mm. and it's you know it's a little bit intrusive, but you know, it seems like that's one of the formats that's going to be around on mobile. And it does seem like the creative is getting a lot better thanks to YouTube's TrueView. I don't know if you follow what they're I haven't doing. followed that exactly. Basically, you know, the idea that you can skip the ad. Mm. So what that and if you skip the ad, the advertiser doesn't pay. So you have that. Oh, is that the brand name for? The, okay. I think it's called TrueView. Okay. Yeah. And so what's very interesting about that is. If you do not click skip, mm. then they pay per view, which is very high, yep. right? Like they're paying 10 yep. cents or 20 cents for the, each view. Which they should. It's which they it, should, because yeah. it's worth it, which means they're now incented to make something so compelling in the first 15 seconds that you keep watching, mm. or five seconds, I don't know, I think maybe it's five seconds. So you, you have to just really embrace it. I really sort of feel like YouTube's changed the whole creative process yeah. for, for ad agencies. Um, and so let's just, talk a little bit about being an international company. You wound up getting Sequoia to invest. I'm mm -hmm. assuming Danny Reimer and Index was a really good indicator for them that there was something here. But were you one of the first times they've ever invested in something in Europe? Because they, they don't have an office in Europe, or do they? Maybe they added one. No, they have an office in, in Israel. In uh, Israel? Yeah. Which is India? China? Not Europe, I guess. But not Europe. Very close to Europe. It feels like it's part of Europe yeah. <laughs> sometimes. But they don't have one in Europe specifically. No, no they don't. What do you I think actually about? do. I actually do think we were the first investment in Europe for Sequoia, which is yeah. crazy, given that it's a virtual doll. Yeah. Site. What do you attribute <laughs> that to? I mean, they just saw the scale, they saw the growth, they liked the management team. What? Now, you know, they, they, they on a plane Sequ Sequoia ride? invested in 2006, and at that time, I think they wanted to do something in Europe. Mm. They wanted to do, you know, I have to ask them. You can yeah. get it. But I think they wanted to do something in Europe. I think they wanted to do something with Index, who was already a rising star yeah. in Europe, and we happened to be the company where yeah. those intersected. Interesting. Um, and they come out to, they fly to Europe for the board meetings? I mean, No, I, I usually come out. Since we have an office here, I usually uh, come out here and I go up to San Francisco. And, and so what do you think the eventuality is for, for this cross-media company now that mobile's taken over and sort of going into uh, all these new devices? You know, if we look five years from now, part of Disney, I mean, is that like where you think this is all going? It seems like Disney has been really great at leveraging these brands and building them into like amusement park things? Do you think the Angry Birds sort of approach of making merchandise, et cetera, is, is the future? I mean, it's definitely worked for, for, for Angry Birds, yeah. you know, another Scandinavian company. Exactly. You know, there's a lot of, the lot of, there's there? a lot of great, yeah. And we have Clash of, you know, the company behind the Clash of Clans. Oh, is, are they from there as well? They're from Superlic? Finland. And then we have uh, our Swedish Superlic? friends at King.com and Minecraft. Oh, those are both out of there too. Both Swedish. So Sweden and Finland is on a roll right now. What do you attribute all that to? I mean, is it, is it I mean, obviously you have a highly educated population there. You have high affluence, but what do you... A lot of smart people have said smart things about this. I think it comes down to, you know, the, the, the brain part of me says, yes, we have a lot of good engineering talent historically mm -hmm. in, in Scandinavia. We have good schools. We have yeah. all of that. The heart side of me says, are we a lot of cold, dark nights where there's nothing to do? <laughs> so people... Really? People spend a lot of time uh, thinking about stuff. And when you grew up in Sweden and Finland, you know, you, you know that you're kind of at the fringe of the world somehow. Mm -hmm. So you don't really have to follow what everyone else is doing. I think sometimes we allow ourselves to be, 
you know, to let go of the herd a little bit. We allow ah. ourselves to go. And that is cultural. To some degree, yeah. Well, I mean, if you but I think we also, if you look at Sweden, for example, Sweden historically has had a lot of great export uh, industries, a lot of great engineering companies, a lot of machinery. Yeah. You know, Sweden loves products. Yeah. Sweden knows that if you're going to survive, you have to make product that ships internationally because the domestic market yeah, is so small. About, yeah, it's low not single-digit millions, five, it's, ten it's, million people. Uh, nine million people in Sweden. You yeah. don't have to. You know, the the market's so small. You have to think internationally. You have yeah. to think export, and I think part of that's in our blood as well. So when I start, you know, when I started Stardall, I immediately didn't. Yeah, I had to think international because the you know the, the portion of Swedish nine million people who are in the target group of playing you know Stardall.com would be a couple of hundred thousand. Obviously, sure. that's not enough. Hmm. Maybe. Uh, if I'd grown up in the U.S., I probably wouldn't have thought about that. I would have thought about conquering the U.S. market first. And the happiness level in the Scandinavian countries, amongst the highest in the world, in fact, the, the function of government and the functioning of government is considered the benchmark. Getting to Denmark is one of those terms of having a high functioning democracy. It's a pretty amazing place to live in terms of the happiness level of people and how people are taken care of. Do you, you feel like it's a society that has figured it out when the rest of the world maybe can't seem to balance socialism and capitalism and maybe Scandinavia sort of balanced those two? I don't know if it's up to me to, to put, uh, well, you live there, put so a I mean, brand on what's... Uh, I definitely think that the work-life balance, the balance between opportunity and society, mm. between, you know, chances of making it for yourself versus a just society for everyone is pretty well leveled in Scandinavia. I think it's a great society to live in. It's I pay my taxes though. with pride because I think you I get something for it. Taxes, yeah. I think I get something for it. Yeah. I think the whole society gets something for it. And you have things there like very long maternity, paternity leave, uh, upwards a of year, a year. A year. Paid. Paid. You pay that or the government pays it? The government pays it, wow. and uh, out of that, one month is dedicated to the dad. Uh -huh. So j that's changed a lot in the last 10 years. So mm -hmm. when I had my first child, it was still not very common amongst dads to take a part of that. Yeah. Now I would say 9 out of 10 dads take at least a month paternity leave, if not 2 or 3. You All have right. 12 months. You can split that however you want between the mom and the dad, except a month that is dedicated to the dad. There has to be one month dedicated to the dad. And they're talking about having making that two months now, which I totally support. And, and it's amazing in your society that you can have these discussions and actually progress, and we can't keep 30-round magazines out of guns. They're so polarized here. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary in a way. I mean, how, how do... How, how, does any of this have an adverse effect on your ability to run the company is, I guess, my question? Because being an American... I think I come to it with a bias of no regulation, move fast, you know, f you can uh, have employment at will, employee can leave at any time, yeah. employee can file. You can't just let people go, can you? Sweden's changed, I mean, Sweden's changed a lot in the last yeah. 15, 20 years. I mean, in the 70s and 80s, Sweden was a terrible country for entrepreneurs. Super high taxes, you had employment laws that made it basically impossible for you to lay off people, you know. Uh, Similar to France. France is still there. Yeah. <laughs> Sweden has, made, to to a, Sweden has made a lot of changes in the last 10, 15, 20, 20 years. I would say Sweden is a great, great country to start up a company and run a company in. We do still have pretty high taxes when it comes to you know, the social costs that you pay. But corporate you know, income tax is now among the lowest in Europe with 23%. Mm. And it's easy to set up a company. We have no corruption. We have a great talent pool. Things work, mm. yada, yada. I think it's a great country to, to run a company and set up a company. Yeah, I've been monitoring. And actually, Tyler Crowley, who you know yeah. works with me, is I, camped out in Sweden. Yeah, yeah I'm going to see him next week. You're going to see him next yeah. week? There you the go. Week well, after, tell him I said hi, and uh, we miss him here. I'm, like, I, it used to be on every program here, chiming yeah. in from the rafters. But then again, you know, I'm here in L.A. This is a great place. You know, It's great. It you snowed know. in Stockholm yesterday. So there are things. The sun is nice. The sun I, is nice. I just think as an American, you know, as I've gotten older and I just look at the dysfunction of our society, some of the things that happen, people being left behind, and the just sort of the angry way in which the two ends of the extreme takeover the dialogue is just severely broken 
and it, it doesn't represent the majority. You know, 98% of that, what, well over 90% of people, for example, in this country want to have background checks on guns. We can't get them. It, the, the, what the population wants and what the government does is just so out of whack. And in, and in Denmark, and this whole term getting to Denmark, which I've been studying, and some of these other countries, in Scandinavia, it just seems like you're so in sync with what the general population wants. And the media seems to be in sync with that as well, does it not? I can't comment on the U.S. We'll, we'll do that on another <laughs> Well, show. I'm commenting on the U.S. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, listen, you love the U.S. Uh, Matthias, congratulations on uh, all the success. And um, I'm certain you're hiring. So if people want to move to... S if you're a mobile developer, and you we'd love move. you because they're <laughs> scarce in Stockholm as well. Yeah, you got to make them, don't you? Yeah. You make them. Exactly. That's what I tell people. If you can't find the people, just make them. Get, you know, support them. All right, listen, uh, you've been a great ga guest. Everybody uh, follow Stardoll on Twitter. Uh, go check it out and uh, look for the iPad app coming when? Soon. In a month. Okay, in a month. Great, perfect. Make sure, uh, hey, uh, make sure we put uh, a link at the beginning of the episode, a big annotation, Brandis. I want a big annotation that links to Stardoll's um, you have a YouTube channel, I take it? We have a YouTube channel. So I want to link to their YouTube channel when they have their video about their iPad app so we can get people over there and then put in the description a link to their app store link. Let's just, like, Brandis, try to do that for everybody who's on the show. Like, you know how I give them plugs at the end? I'd like to get some more plugs in the document, like in the description on YouTube and the links. This way people really appreciate being on the show and see the power of the audience downloading their apps. Thanks so much to at ShareFile. Uh, for sponsoring the program and our other sponsor. Um, and Matthias, thanks so much for being so honest and uh, congratulations on all your success and good luck on the transition. Who said it was success? <laughs> oh, come on. And you have tens of millions of people and you've got yeah, hundreds of employees. And, it's, but a you new, don't, you, it's, it's a new start on mobile now. I mean, mobile is totally new for everyone. It, and, and you new, do. New rules. And you have to be. New humble. competition, new you everything. Have to, you have to get the whole company humble, don't you? You've got to get everybody hungry and humble again. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, we're, you know, we're kind of starting over, I would say, on mobile. It's a completely new set of rules. Scary and, and exciting. Scary and exciting, exactly. And how do you, how do you uh, get the rank and file, the troops, up for that battle? Do you tell them, like, hey, listen, we're going to, we're basically starting over, and this is a whole new world. we got to really kick ass. And Yes. Yeah. I think everyone sees it. Everyone see, of course, everyone is a consumer as well. You know, everyone yeah. who, who has a smartphone knows that that's where you're spending your time and, and your money. And everyone who, who, you know, has a daughter or a son, mm -hmm. you know, growing up sure. knows that even more. So, God. of course, Daddy, you know, if, your your com if your company is directed toward that audience, you better be successful on that platform because it's like every other new medium that comes. You know, the users shift first and then comes the money and then we have to work things out. And Yeah. It seems to me, somebody told me one time that if... If your company is winning in the marketplace, you're going to have great culture at your company. If you're losing, mm -hmm. it's very hard to have good culture or positivity, and you're going to have infighting. That's just the nature of it. People want to be winning. Exactly. And I think going yeah. to this platform means greater chance of winning, and they see that, and they recognize it and want to win. Yeah. But you also have to really, you know, for a company like us, we're starting over. You know, we were winning, we were winning on the web. On mobile now, we, uh, you know... Yeah, starting from we zero. have a lot of no. We're not starting from zero. We have a brand. We have oh, that's assets. True. That's true, yeah. We have a team. Yeah, we you're, have starting a lot a sec, of, you're starting at second base. We have a lot base. of strength. Yes, yeah, tech exactly. A very American baseball analogy. Fifty uh, yard line. How would you say? How would you say it in <laughs> soccer or football rather? Uh, yeah, you're probably like, start at the midline. You know, the midline, the, the, the midfield line. Midfield, I don't know what's yeah, the you're English at midfield or something. Right, yeah. Or what's the what's the red zone called? When you're almost about to score. In the hockey. <laughs> yeah, something or red zone. Sweden is hockey. Is it hockey really? Yeah, it's more hockey. So you're on a. Your, your power line. play. You're on the blue line power play. Yeah. Blue line power play. There you go, Stardoll. Good luck with everything, Matthias. It's been Thanks, a great Jason. episode. And uh, follow at Jason, of course. Follow at Matthias. Miksha, M-I-K-S-C-H-E. Miksha. Matthias Miksha. And uh, follow at Jason. Follow at TWI Startups. And go to twistlist.co if you want to join the secret mailing list. Twist, L-I-S-T dot C-O to join the secret back channel mailing list. If you made it to this portion of the program, you deserve to know about twistlist.co. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups.